Chicago no more. Good evening, I'm political editor Dennis Welch, and this is Politics Unplugged, and we are once again turning our attention to education, specifically school voucher programs. And with us today to talk about this is State Senator Debbie Lesko. She currently has a bill that would greatly expand Arizona's program. Thank you very much for joining us now in Arizona. It's commonly known as a, a, a voucher program, but it's uh, technically known as the Empowerment Scholarship Account. Um, explain a little bit about the history of that and what it does. Sure. Basically, the reason that I'm sponsoring this bill is to give another option to parents to choose the best education for their child. So we started this program in Arizona. We were the first in the nation in 2011. And uh, right now it services special needs children, children that are stuck in um, low performing schools, failing schools. And so we want to open up this up to all children over a four year period. And again, this is a program where people are e either uh, given tax credits, money that's diverted away from the general fund. Um, it's put like on some sort of a debit card and they can use this to take uh, enroll their kids in private parochial schools, correct? What this does is take 90% of what the school district would have received if that child went to that school and gives it to the parent and then the money is monitored. It has to be spent on certain educational things. Uh, it could be online learning, it could be a tutor, it could be private schools and the parent decides what is best for their child the money follows the child. Yeah, exactly. And we'll get into a little bit of that. But what is the mm -hmm. ultimate goal here at the end of the day? You were talking about expanding this over a period of like four or five years to how many children here in Arizona? Well, in a, a period of four years, we'd phase out eligibility to all public school students. So there's 1.1 million students, mm -hmm. but there's still a cap on the program. And so even though all the students would be eligible in four years, we still cap it at an enrollment growth of about 5,500 students per year out of the 1.1 million. So really a very small uh, number of students would be eligible. But technically all students in Arizona would be eligible after a period of four years, 1.1 million of them. Uh, co correct. Okay. Correct. And what is the estimate then of how many people will be taking, you know, how, hey, let's start with where, how many kids are taking advantage of this now and yeah. families taking advantage of this now and what is the estimate of where this will be in four years? You know, right now about 3,100 students take advantage of the ESA program and we've had testimony from parents and students who are thrilled with the program. We had a lady from, a parent from South Phoenix who testified that her child was stuck in a failing school down in South Phoenix, but with the ESA program, they were able to use that money and put her in a private school where she is now thriving. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, this is a great program. The goal is to spread out eligibility to all students. However, there's still the cap on that. So why not keep the students, keep the kids in public schools? I mean, obviously, you look at the history of public schools. You've had presidents that went to public schools. You had people like uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Stephen Jobs, Bill Gates. They all went to, pro uh, to public schools. It seemed like it worked out pretty well for them. And all three of my children went to the district public schools. And I think most parents will probably choose the district public schools. But just like charter schools, parents love choice. They want to choose the best option for their child because not all children are the same. And so they want different options. And just like we have uh, the option of charter schools now, I would like parents to have the option of using this ESA to pick a, a better fit for their child. Now you said that, uh, earlier, you said let the, the money follow the students. I've, mm -hmm. I've heard that for a number of years down at the, uh, the state legislature as this program has expanded and grown. Mm -hmm. However, uh, a fiscal note that was put on your bill says it would actually cost state taxpayers roughly $24 million uh, in four years. That would be money that would be diverted away from the general fund. Why would the taxpayers want to do this um, if this takes money away from the state? The state, uh, the, the fiscal note deals with one pot of money and only one pot of money that goes to pay for schools. And so overall, if you include all the funding, we spend $9,500 per student per year here in Arizona on average. The average uh, ESA for a non-special needs student is $5,600. So obviously there's a savings of about $4,000 there. Now, if you look at just the state general fund, that's what the fiscal note is saying. But if you think about it, if the same students moved to a charter school instead of using an ESA, it would actually cost the state general fund 
more at the tune of six hundred dollars so you're taking per issue year. with that fiscal no no i'm not taking issue with the fiscal no okay. what i'm saying is that that's only looking at one pot of the money but if a student uses an ESA, their savings on overrides at an average of $585 a student to taxpayers and $981 per student per year for bonds that they're not going to be utilizing because only district schools can use bonds and overrides. So overall, it's a savings to taxpayers. But my overall goal is not that. My overall goal is to give another option to parents to choose the best education for their child. This is a national movement. Mm -hmm. Parents love choice, and that's what I'm trying to do. Sure. What, what, what about accountability here? I know that mm -hmm. there was an Auditor General report uh, a, about a year ago that came out and showed over $100,000 had been misspent in this money. Again, this is money that's loaded up onto something that looks incredibly like, like a debit card to go mm -hmm. out and spend for books, materials, put them, enroll them into school and stuff like that. How, how are you going to make sure that uh, these parents are held accountable, that they're only spending this money on what they're supposed to be? Yeah, and I looked at that Auditor General report and obviously if somebody is using it fraudulently, we want to make sure that they're charged and put in jail and be held accountable. But Senator Smith actually has an accompanying bill that works with mine that addresses a lot of these concerns and actually requires that this be done by a private company organization where all the expenses will be listed out there for the public to see. Uh, and so obviously you read that report, you obviously know also in that report there was only one auditor uh, that was looking at the expenses on all this. What does your bill do? Does it do anything to uh, increase oversight of these monies? Anything like that? Senator Smith's bill does. And so we're working together and we've met with the Department of Education. We've met with the Treasurer's Office. And there is a private organization, a private company, uh, that already does this for schools and they will have the oversight and be doing all of the financial things because we want more oversight we want accountability well why not uh, uh, why a private company why not a government company or uh, why not the government do this I mean they're already in the business of uh, auditing this kind of stuff why not just have the uh, uh, education department look at this over well, right now the Education Department is looking it over along with the state treasurers, but as this program grows, as I hope that it will, I think it's the right thing to do is to have it subbed out to a private organization or a private company that does this for a living. They know what they're doing, and so I think that's the best route. And uh, one of the last questions here I want to ask you is there was a, a recent study done by Tulane University that found that students in Louisiana uh, who use their voucher program actually fell behind students in public schools. Care to respond to that? I'm not familiar with that report, but what I can tell you is that we had testimony upon testimony in our committees in the Senate uh, from students and parents who absolutely love the program sure. and their students have excelled. But is that anecdotal evidence, though? I mean, this is a, a study that looked at this. Have you, has there been any studies that looked at the performance between uh, students and, uh, that take advantage of these programs and public school students? I think ultimately it's the parent will decide what is best for their child. So I think of a parent uh, that one's choice is probably going to be paying attention to see if this school does a good job. And if not, they'll move that, that student either back to the district school or a charter school or another private school. All right. Thanks a lot. We're going to have to take a quick break here, but we have lots more to, here to come on Politics Unplugged. Coming up next, Republicans unveil their health care plan. But for many women, it may feel like a plan to take health care away. Plus, did accusations of wiretapping help or hurt President Trump? A closer look at the politics of tweeting here on Politics Unplugged. Tuesdays and Thursdays, Good Morning Arizona is Living Large. From 8 to 10, Good Morning Arizona is taking you inside some of the most fabulous, over-the-top dream homes in our state. Incredible kitchens, breathtaking backyards, a rare peek into luxurious private homes that you truly have to see to believe. We're giving you millions of reasons to watch. Tuesday and Thursday mornings, only on 3TV. 
American Furniture Warehouse is proud to introduce our new website, AFW.com. It's packed with new features like faster search, faster filtering, even the name is faster. We've added other great features like shop the look, guest bloggers, and tips and product pairings from our own professional in-house design team. Product reviews allow you to see what other customers have to say about our thousands of in-stock items that we can deliver anywhere in our own fleet of trucks. Come see for yourself at the new AFW.com. It looks like Arizona bowling champion Shannon Plurowski is ready. Let's see what kind of spin she puts on this next one. Yep, Arizona winners choose Casino Arizona, where locals rule. The time is now to take your shot at March Mania. You could win up to $250,000 in drawings every Monday and Tuesday in March. And it looks like Shannon approves another perfect game. I'm Russell Shaw with Realty One Group. For years I've been telling you, we help more home sellers sell, offer flexible commissions, the right to sell it yourself, and if you're not happy, fire me. Let my results speak. It was on the market for 12 days and sold. 13 days after listing, we're under contract. We had a contract in 19 hours. I'm not bragging. I'm applying for a job. I want to be your realtor. Call 602-957-7777. Thank you. Home isn't just where you start and end your day. It's where life imitates art. Or music. Or food. Or whatever it is that inspires you. Living Spaces invites you to explore this unique intersection of lifestyle and home through Behind the Design, a new series where we celebrate life and style through in-depth conversations, profiles, and stories. We welcome you to become part of our community at livingspaces.com slash behind the design. Republicans in Congress this past week unveiled their replacement plan for Obamacare, but many say this is a plan that will do more harm than good for women and their health. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. And joining us now to talk about health care reform and women's issues is Brian Howard, president of Planned Parenthood here in Arizona. Thank you very much for stopping by here. And let's start off a little bit and just talk about, you know, why is uh, defunding Planned Parenthood part of this overhaul um, to Obamacare in the first place? What have you been hearing? Well, that's a good question why it w would be in there. But I'd like to start by saying there are at least two major components of this proposal um, uh, that harm women. Uh, number one, there is the elimination. T today, under the Affordable Care Act, women are guaranteed that their insurance premium will have to cover the full cost of their birth control. They can't be charged a copay that could reach into the hundreds of dollars for more expensive methods. It has to be, the entire cost has to be covered under their premium. Mm -hmm. um, that goes away. And so women could find many methods of birth control unaffordable under this coming plan. Um, and then the second proposal is that um, by name, women for one year, uh, women and men for one year under uh, Medicaid will be prohibited from coming to Planned Parenthood with their Medicaid benefit. Gotcha. Now, obviously, you know, this is all framed around a, a lot about the uh, abortion procedures that are provided by Planned Parenthood. Explain a little bit about that because as, as, as um, most of what I've read and heard is your organization doesn't really uh, provide that many of them if, compared to the overall services there. So talk to us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, first of all, since uh, the mid-1970s, under federal law, uh, it has been, uh, by and large, uh, uh, federal funds have been unable to cover the cost of abortion, except in certain you know, specific instances of rape and incest mm -hmm. and um, endangering the woman's life. Um, so, so funding, um, federal funds, are not used for abortion in the first, case, uh, in the first place. Um, uh, Second of all, um, we are only, we don't get a check. We don't just get a lump sum of money um, periodically from the federal government. We are reimbursed for specific services that we provide, whether they're annual exams, um, birth control methods, uh, uh, pap smears, breast exams. We're reimbursed only once we provided the service. Mm -hmm. um, so there's really no connection between abortion care and the services that are being reimbursed by the feds. Sure, and I, and I know that's the argument. I spoke with uh, Kathy Hare the other day, and she's the head of the Center for Arizona po uh, Policy. Conservative group opposes abortion, and her take is why should any f public funds be going to support uh, an organization that performs these types of procedures? Well, uh, I've 
had a lot of dealings with Ms. Herrick over the years, and um, I would contend that, uh, uh, you know, from Kathy Herrick and the Planned Parenthood's opponent's perspective, what they're opposed to is what Planned Parenthood stands for, which is the belief that women and families um, should make their own decisions about their health care from beginning to end. Um, you know, we were just hearing about the importance of choice when it comes to education. Mm -hmm. Women and families should be able to decide what health care is appropriate for them uh, and uh, whether it relates to reproductive health um, to their sexual health. Um, Kathy Herod just doesn't agree with that. Um, she believes that politicians should be making that decision and deciding what services are covered and also where you can go. Um, and uh, we thought that uh, that was... Uh, we did not think that that was uh, Republican orthodoxy. Well, and also, uh, uh, Ms. Herod also uh, spoke a lot about uh, other community health clinics that provide the same services uh, that Planned Parenthood does, but they don't offer um, a, the abortion procedure, and that people are for, or could be uh, going to get their health care needs filled there. So um, it is true that uh, what are known as community health, uh, federally qualified community health centers, um, like uh, Mountain Park, um, um, in Adelante here in the Phoenix area, um, El Rio in Tucson, um, do include in the total mix of services um, family planning and testing and treatment for sexually transmitted infections. Um, but they are in no way specialized and they are in no way experts in this particular aspect of health care. There must be some reason that 33,000 patients came to us last year um, specifically for this care. And I'd add that a third of all of those, um, so over 10,000, came to us with some amount, some type of federal support. Those are the women who are at risk of being unable to come to Planned Parenthood in the future. Yeah, and what about these possible cuts to Medicaid and if uh, its effects on women? Now, three quarters of all public dollars for uh, family planning come in the form of Medicaid. Half of all births in this country, and even here in Arizona, I believe it's 52 percent of all births are covered by Medicaid, including two thirds of all unplanned births. Correct. Um, so we have a real problem in this country that. Um, uh, we aren't really talking about the value of family planning as much as we did, say, back in the 1960s when the National Family Planning Program was actually created. And as a result today, half of all pregnancies are unplanned and unintended. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, half of the deliveries that we are done in the state are paid for by taxpayers through the Medicaid program. Um, we can address that if we make sure women have access to family planning. And I also wanted to uh, ask you about this, too, because uh, from what I uh, understand, uh, you know, more and more, obviously, some men use these uh, uh, the services provided by you, but it's also a lot of the immigrant refugee populations are becoming to depend on Planned Parenthood. Speak a little bit about, about that. So um, you know, we are um, a trusted provider in a variety of communities, whether it's the Latino community, um, other or immigrant populations, um, the young. Um, uh, uh, we are understood to be a safe and trustworthy source uh, for these services. Mm -hmm. um, that's why people um, seek us out by reputation. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about removing either the federal family planning f program funds or you're talking about removing Medicaid, you are putting access to um, these services at risk for these vulnerable populations. Are you at all concerned about any backlash, though, from providing services potentially to uh, people who are here illegally? Um, obviously, this is a hot button issue, and if you are, per, and uh, from my understanding, is you, you guys don't check for documentation there. Uh, we do any, not any, check any, citizenship yeah, status yeah. for our patients. Yeah. We believe health care is a basic human right that every single person in the state ought to have access to quality, trust, uh, trustworthy, accurate, um, complete health care. Um, and we don't think that your citizenship status ought to play a role in whether you can get that care. All right. Well, thanks. So that's all the time we have for this segment. But we have lots more to talk about here on Politics Unplugged. Donald Trump accuses Barack Obama of spying on him. A closer look at the tweet about listening that has people talking. On the campaign trail, President Trump said the unemployment numbers were bogus. But the latest figures could have him working on a new line. Just that. I'm a time management expert. I plan on every minute of every day. But that all changed when I was rear-ended. Nobody plans to be in an accident, but unfortunately they happen. If you're suffering in pain, call Emergency Chiropractic. They will treat you with no deductibles, no co-pays, and no out-of-pocket costs. Emergency Chiropractic can help get my life back on schedule. Emergency Chiropractic, the kind of care you want today. Buckle up. 
Markdown Madness is on at Arizona's number one Chevy dealer for two years in a row, Midway Chevrolet. Now lease a new 2017 Cruze for just $129 a month. Lease a new Equinox for only $149 a month. New 17 Malibu lease for an amazing $179 a month. Or choose a neutral first. Lease yours for just $219 a month. Markdown Madness. That's absolutely unbeatable. That's Midway Chevrolet. If you've been diagnosed with cancer, searching for answers, like where to treat, can feel overwhelming. So start your search with a specialist at Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Start with teams of cancer treatment experts under one roof, focused on the delivery of precision cancer treatment. Start at one of the Cancer Treatment Centers of America hospitals near you. The evolution of cancer care is here. Learn more at cancercenter.com slash experts. Appointments available now. Phoenix is gorgeous. Warm weather, blue skies, the Sonoran Desert. And what's better than doing something amazing in my city? Doing it for free. Hey, we hear you. It's why AARP is keeping Phoenix in motion with fun free cultural events for you and your friends. Discover the stress relief of our drum circles or enjoy a night at the movies with us. If you don't think this is right for me when you think AARP, then you don't know ARP. Get to know us at AARP.org slash Phoenix. We can do any job, and we're the cheapest in town. So call today and get a free, 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 free sandwich. Well, how to come? These have some pretty ridiculous offers. At Parker and Sons, we're affordable, but never cut quality or offer something you don't need. If you want quality work at a fair price, call Parker for all your plumbing, heating, cooling, and drain cleaning needs. And I promise there'll be no Melvins on your job. Call 602 to repair to get it done. And welcome back to Politics Unplugged. It's time to talk it out with our partners from First Strategic. And with us today is Kurt Davis and Steve Rowan. Gentlemen, let's just dive right into it. That voucher bill, we started off talking the show, on the show with talking about, is it going to pass? Yes, because if Senator Lesko is working on something, I have a feeling she'll get those <laughs> last one or two votes. Well, come on, what about the optics of this, Steve? I mean, uh, we're talking about passing a bill that would uh, divert taxpayer money away from the general fund, possibly out of schools at a time when you're saying, I want to put more money into schools. Well, it could be, but it's also about parent parental choice, and there's a huge issue about that and a huge following. Mm -hmm. And the ability of that and the issue of charter schools and how they're working, this all fits together, and I think it has a very good now chance. When did it become diversion when we are having money follow a student? Well, that's up for debate. As we were saying, that there was that fiscal note that said it's actually going to cost taxpayers, taxpayer money Senator to send these Lesko's kids. Senator Lesko's right. The, the honest and fair way is to look at the total cost of a student. In that, and that includes all the different funds that feed into f to finance an Arizona student. And I would always argue if you had more money in the backpacks, mm -hmm. your schools would improve because parents would be voting with their kids' backpack every day, year in and year out. All right, let's move on now to uh, the health care debate, the, t the, the, the fight to... Uh overhaul the uh, Obamacare. Now, a lot of Republican governors, uh, the Republican plan as it stands right now would turn a lot of this uh, money going to states into a block grant. Um, doesn't seem like Republican governors are very comfortable with that right now. I think part of it is is because you've heard so much back and forth, like, like you did under Obamacare, about it, what it does or doesn't do. So there's a lot of myths out there about what it does, and there's certain realities about what it does. I think as they get a chance to explain the changes, most of the governors will probably end up being supportive. And part of the issue is that it's the way it's structured is the three-phase plan because mm -hmm. they have to do it through reconciliation if they're going to get it through the Senate because they got to do it without getting 60 votes in the Senate. So they have to do it in certain phases. And some of it is done by reconciliation. Some of it is done by regulation where the new director, uh, secretary can deal with changing regulations. And then finally, the third stage would be going into some laws. But that's after the first two are done. Now, I want to go back to Kurt Wallen this because you worked up in the ninth floor, you know a lot about this type of issue. Now, a big part of this plan, too, is about freezing enrollment into Medicaid um, over the next two, three, or three, three years, uh, by 2020, I believe. What would that do to Arizona's budget if uh, the, there was the cap on uh, the freeze on Medicaid and the state had to pick up the costs? Well, if, if you, it depends on what, the, what, the, what it's frozen at, mm -hmm. and it depends on actually when it is frozen. Best Be case, worst case. 
Well, I mean, worst case, it, it could be very uncomfortable for the state. However, if you, you need the management tools that as Steve mentioned that come with it, the bigger question is, is what load point can the state sustain and not not because of the transfer. I'm talking about in totality. Medicaid is growing at a rate that it cannot it cannot sustain itself either federally or through the state. Changes have to happen. All right. Now let's move on to another big story that happened last week. We've been talking about all week. It actually happened last weekend, and that is President Trump on Saturday tweeting out and accusing the former President Barack Obama of tapping his phones. Um, so far, no evidence of anything like this happening. If it turns out that this is untrue, does the president owe the former president an apology? I won't answer that yet because I think I have a theory about this because you also said there's no evidence about it. There's also no evidence as well about any Russia relationships that they have in mm -hmm. terms of collusion. And the DNI director, Clapper, came out on that Sunday saying two important pieces. There was no evidence about that and there's no evidence about uh, tapping Obama's uh, uh, tapping Obama's Obama tapping Trump's phones. Uh, I have a theory that Trump wanted to poorly. I, by the way, I don't agree with his methodology or doing it, but I think he just wanted to say, you guys are doing it to me, I can do it to you. I, you you're throwing out all this stuff and I can throw it all out. Not appropriate. I totally agree. I think there are a lot of, uh, people would say there's a lot of legitimate questions about the Russia connection between the current administration and Russia. It's very different than... No, there's absolutely no proof, according to the DNI, that's, that's that different there's than, any relationship. Yeah. Just like there's absolutely no proof of what Trump's saying, and I'm saying what's good for the goose is good for the gander. There's, in, there, there, are legi wrong. there could be legitimate questions between the relationship between Donald Trump and, and the administration, the campaign, and Russia. That's a lot different than a tweet that seemed to come out of nowhere, Kurt. Well, I mean, if, if there's going to be apologies for mm -hmm. false accusations in Washington, it's going to take at least a century to get through them all. <laughs> um, that, the number one. But number two is it, Russian relationships mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C., are you kidding me? I mean, Hillary Clinton absorbed how many millions of dollars from the Russians into her private foundation. Yeah. I mean, that issue goes all over the place. Uh, They're both wrong. Okay. Right. okay, let's move on now. This is actually some good news on the economy this last week. And we added 235,000 jobs in February. So who gets the credit, Steve? Barack Obama or Donald Trump? Or neither. <laughs> but how about or both? both? How about both? Uh, <laughs> how about yeah. the businessmen and women that actually created well, those jobs? Yeah, I go. think that's the best answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that the argument could both. be that Obama gets a bit of that credit, but also they, there's an argument that, okay, your first quarter in the presidency, the results go back to the previous president. In this particular case, mm -hmm. you've got some unique circumstances where a lot was going on before he ever took office as well. And I think that there's, you know, the Trump bump and a lot of those issues related to the stock market. I think he can definitely take credit for that. So oh. I think it's a little bit of both. Okay, but during the campaign, he said you can't trust these phony mm -hmm. numbers. So are these phony numbers, these real numbers, where are we at here? Well, it's like CPI, right? Cost of living. It depends on what you're measuring, right? So we changed CPI a few years back because it was inconvenient to tell people that actually inflation was a lot higher than it really was. Mm -hmm. So we changed it. Unemployment figures. Is it full employment? Is it part-time employment? Is it 40-hour week FTEs? I mean, all of those things. So I, these numbers, to average American, you know what matters is whether they can actually get up on Monday morning and go to work or not. All right. We're going to have to end it there on that note. But that is all the time we have for Politics Unplugged tonight. Be sure to join us next week for more politics unplugged. Good night.